It's springtime in the marsh. Wonders of wetlands are at their best right now. There's loves in the air. There's ducks doing mating dances. There's birds calling everywhere. The, the plants are coming back to life. The, uh, the, the ones that were sleeping all winter are coming back and waking up. So it's just so full of life. This is the best time to be at Okamak Marsh in my books because that's when the birds are coming back, looking for places to nest. It's a fascinating time of the year. It's very electrifying. We don't have the same big numbers that we have in the fall, but we have a bigger diversity. Lots of different species coming from everywhere. It's super fascinating. So come with me and explore what's going on at the marsh in the springtime. As we can see, those nets, called mist nets, are very fine meshed, so birds don't really see them as they're flying through. They fly into the pocket and they kind of get tangled up a little bit like a little hammock. Then we come in and retrieve the bird. Now in this case, this bird is kind of a little tangled up, so we're trying to extract it gently from the net. There's a few ways to do it. Uh, we have to be careful and it actually doesn't really hurt the bird. It's uh, just a question of finding the right place that the bird got in. And once the bird is ext extracted, then we take it back to the bird banding station. After catching the birds in the net, what we do is we bring the birds here to the banding station where the bird is identified. Uh, basically, we look at different measurements. We look at the uh, size of the birds. We're uh, aging the birds. We're uh, trying to see if it's a male or a female. And then we'll put a little, little tiny band on its leg to give him a specific number, which will then be sent to a central location to record its, its origin, where it's been banded. And that way, if somebody else catches it somewhere else around in North America, they'll be able to track down that the bird just was actually indeed caught here at Rokemic Marsh. And that gives us information about its migration patterns. It gives us idea of uh, the status of the population, if they're increasing, decreasing, if there's more males, more females, and so on. So we measure um, the wings. We also take, uh, we record all the information on a piece of paper, which is then sent to uh, Ottawa. And once all this is done, then we will release the bird. I think it's a, a bird that hatched last year. It's age five. So we blow on the uh, abdomen just to see if it's, uh, for one thing, how much fat there is on the bird, as well as to, 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 to sex it to see if it's a male or female. It has fat zero. And this is a young boy, CP1. It's 45 grams. We'll have to minus the bag. The bird we have here is a white throated sparrow. <laughs> and it just took off on us. <laughs> so off it goes. It's actually back into the wild and hopefully we'll get caught someone else and we can see where it's been and where it's going and where it's traveling to understand its migration patterns even better. Now some birds, like the swallows, the tree swallows we see over there, they are birds that are looking for cavities for nesting, like uh, old trees or birdhouses like this. And what they do is they will basically build their nest inside those cavities and lay their eggs and eventually sit on their youngs for about 10 to 12 days. And then they'll come to the nest and feed the youngs when they're born. So those are called uh, or threshold birds. Basically, they need, they need their parents to feed them until they're old enough to be able to fly on their own and to, to gather their own food. So there's, there's, that's the other type of birds. We also have the art, um, precocial birds, like, such as the, the geese and the shorebirds, which basically the parents will sit on the eggs for a much longer period, sometimes 25 to 30 days. But when the youngs are born, they're all ready to go. They basically can have all their feathers, they have all their eyes are open, they can find their own food on their own.
So spring migration is a little different than the fall migration. In the fall, birds tend to flock together. They've done their, ma their mating, they've done their nesting, they've raised their young, and they're all congregating to go south together. In the spring, it's a bit different. They're a bit more territorial. You'll uh, not often see big, huge flocks of birds flying together. They'll usually be more um, individuals or pairs trying to find a nesting site. Except in the case, for example, like these uh, purple martins, they tend to be more communal. They, they, they nest together, so these guys would tend to still come back as a larger group and flock together and, and gather together. But the majority of birds have, they'll, be more, um, they'll be more aggressive, they'll be more defending their territory because they know the resources are scarce. It's important to keep enough resources for their young. Ah, the sound of spring, I love it. The birds are coming back, you can hear the geese, you can see some ducks flying back as well. And they have one thing in mind, they want to find the perfect spot for nesting. And as a matter of fact, we have some nesting right on the roof at Overcomic Marsh here. We have a Canada goose sitting on her nest right now, and they'll be sitting on there for about 28 days until the eggs hatched. And then they'll, it'll be the, the, the task of finding a way to bring the babies down to the main floor. So they often see the little ducklings or goslings just walking along the edge and then jumping until they can find their way to the water. And that's quite interesting because birds are super well adapted to those kind of situations. Wood duck, for example, which is another species of waterfowl, will nest in trees fairly high, sometimes 30 meters. And the same thing happens. The very first day they're born, they have to jump down that tree to follow mom to the closest body of water. Birds are really resilient. So we have a um, quite a few here that will nest here, whether on the marsh itself or on the roof, and they're just basically trying to find the perfect habitat to raise their youngs, uh, successfully raise their youngs throughout the year. It's not easy actually, a lot of the nests will get destroyed, either by fluctuation of water, by predation, a lot of animals like to eat eggs as well. So if the first nest is destroyed, then they will try again a second time. Um, if the second nest is destroyed, they may decide to give up for this year or keep on going. So it all depends on the species, but it's not easy being it. Other creatures that emerge from hibernation after a long winter are the, the snakes, the different garter snakes. Uh, we have Manitoba is, well, is very famous for its uh, garter snake population, especially in the Narcissus area. But garter snakes actually require wetlands. This is their, their main food source area. This is their hunting ground. They love to eat frogs and also the critters that are found in wetlands like Okamek Marsh here. And what they do after spending the whole long winter underground, they'll basically come out and look for a mate. They have those big uh, mating balls and they, they, they oft, you often see on different pictures, or if you go to Narciss, you'll see those mating balls where you can have up to hundreds of snakes trying to mate with one female. And one mating is done, that's when they all spread out and go to the wetlands uh, scattered throughout the interlake area. So snake, another one of those uh, critters that like to hibernate in the winter, come out in the spring and starts to go hunting. Back in the fall, they'll go back into the dance and start hibernating again, but now they're on a the prowl. They're looking for little frogs to eat this summer. Well, something else that comes to life in the spring is all those small invertebrates that were sort of trapped under the ice in the winter. Now they're all free to go wherever they want, and you can see the diversity is quite large. We have lots of different uh, uh, water boatmen, different types of beetles, and we have a couple of shrimps, little wormy things. So all sorts of uh, inverts that, were, uh, that are finally free to do what they want, which is eat and mate in the springtime. So lots of action. What these things don't know is they're actually um, favorite food for a lot of the birds that are here. One of the reasons why ducks love wetlands so much is because they can find all those critters in the water and they'll eat them. They eat about 5,000 of those invertebrates to lay one single egg. So this is a really important part of the diet. So lucky for them, there's lots of those critters in the marsh here. Now muskrats are also very happy that spring is here because they can finally move from their winter homes, which is a structure they built into the marsh out of cattails and muds. But come springtime, those homes tend to collapse onto themselves, which is not very suitable for the muskrat to live under. Uh, but it's perfect location for a goose to nest on. As a matter of fact, there's a goose nesting on one of the muskrat lodge right in the, uh, over the cattail over here. 
So this was one of the, the, the lodge that the muskrat built for the winter. Come springtime, those lodge collapses, and the muskrat has to go and find a different place to live, often along the banks of a shoreline. They'll dig tunnels, which comes the winter time, they'll have to abandon those tunnels to go back into the marsh to build lodges again. So it's a cycle of uh, the seasons that, uh, that's happening right here. We have uh, some uh, shovelers, northern shovelers swimming by right now. Notice how the males are quite brightly colored, beautiful white flanks with maroon colors and a green head. And the female tends to be kind of brown and dull in colors. Well, that's actually on purpose because the males has to be very flamboyant, very attractive because the female is the one who makes the final pick for her mate. And once the mating is done, all the males leave the female behind and she is the one who has to sit on the nest by herself. Therefore, having some colors that blend with the surrounding is, a bit, is better for her because she won't be picked out by predators. The males, they all leave, they go to some ponds, have some big bachelor party all summer long, and then they eventually lose their beautiful colors. They kind of turn the dull color like the female. And then migration in the fall, they all gather together where the male will gain his beautiful colors again in a chance of being picked by a female for the following year. The, bur the burden of being a male, eh? Something else that has been uh, dormant throughout the whole winter are the plants. And right now, I guess, the sun is out, the temperatures are warmer, they're all ready, they're all exploding, and you can see lots of buds here and lots of... Uh, like those, those willows here are starting to show their, like the pollen is all ready. You can see my fingers are getting yellow just touching it. And that's a sign to tell the insects, come on up, uh, come and get some pollen, come and get some nectar, I'm ready for you. And basically you can pollinate and start reproducing more willows eventually. So that's what the, these, little, uh, these little buds are telling us. And you can see my fingers are turning yellow just barely touching them here. After a long night of hibernating through the winter, those little ground squirrels are finally up and, and active. And you can see they're just running around, they're just chasing each other, they're just very playful right now. And it's a big difference from when they were sleeping. Their heart rate right now is probably about 200 beats per minute. It's like about this fast. When they're sleeping, when they were hibernating, their heart rate was approximately five beats per minute. So it's a big change for them. They went from having just one breath every 10 minutes to now running around like crazy. And you can see they're very playful, very active. And they have one thing in mind as well, is just finding some food and basically spending the summer having fun and just jumping around on the marsh. Uh, the thing is, um, it, it's, it's not easy being a ground squirrel here. Lots of predators will be chasing you, lots of uh, birds of prey, lots of uh, badgers, for example. So you see all those holes everywhere. They basically represent one of the many entrants they can have to their dens under, underground. So under my feet is a big network of tunnels that connects different chambers. So if a, if a ground squirrel is being chased into a, a den, for example, by a fox or a coyote, even if the coyote starts digging into a hole, the ground squirrel can easily pop up a different hole elsewhere and, and make its getaway. So it's quite interesting to, be, to see the, the different social aspect of the ground squirrel here at Okamak Marsh. What's really cool at this time of year in the springtime is it's also the uh, shorebird migration. And some, some of my favorite birds here are actually those two birds over there called American avocets. They're almost like the parrots of shorebird. They have like a peach colored head. They have like a blue bill that's curved upward, blue legs and black and white wings, just beautiful. And what they do is they come here in the spring and they probe through the marsh because the marsh isn't always to full maximum, to full level capacity. So they can probe through the marsh uh, with their beaks, f uh, finding some insects and worms and different invertebrates into the mud without even seeing. They just feel with their beak and then eat all the, the insects like this. So they're beautiful to look at and right now it's like a really great time of the year to come and see the shorebird migration. They're among the first ones or the last ones to arrive and the first ones to leave. So they're here for a very short time. So it's a good time to take advantage of it. Now, 
You've been watching a nice segment called uh, Wonders of Wetlands with Jacques Bourgeois and Rukamek Marsh. Thanks for watching. <laughs>